This is a, the first time uh, I've actually given this talk, which is actually uh, four one-hour talks compressed into a half hour, so you're going to have to bear with me there. Um, but it's also the first time that I've been able to, to really put together a story around uh, some of my academic interests, which is around empathy and how patients and doctors connect, and tie that to the emotions we have with brands and, and market communications. And I'm going to uh, thank uh, the person who asked that last question, and I'm going to build on John's comments and come down definitively, definitively, I hope you will come away after this half hour, uh, that it's not a metaphor, um, that, that humans are wired fundamentally to connect with all kinds of things, primarily with each other, uh, but, but also with inanimate objects, uh, but more importantly, with, with anything that generates an emotion and we have an emotional connection to. Uh, and I, I think everyone in this room will agree that we have very strong emotional connections uh, to, to brands. The other thing I want to mention at the outset is that uh, trust, which is the, the main theme here, uh, is one of many pro-social behaviors, the core of which is empathy. And empathy, quite simply, is the ability to understand another person's uh, state of mind. And the big debate in the empathy literature going back about 20 years was, do you have to be consciously aware of that other person's state of mind, or is it something that, that we unconsciously connect with and, and intuit? Um, and that debate now, I, I believe, is firmly settled on the side that we have all kinds of empathic reactions to people all the time uh, that we're not aware of. And that's sort of the foundation of, of, uh, of the work I've been doing over the last 15 years. So I'm going to give three perspectives on empathy. Uh, the first one is, is the more academic patient-doctor relationship perspective. Uh, the second one is uh, the neurobiologic, uh, which is very exciting because uh, a lot of speculation that was happening three or four decades ago now has been uh, brought to bear by this new science. And then finally, turn it to, uh, to a, a media perspective, and again, how, how brands connect on an emotional level. But first, a, a little cartoon. Uh, it's got to come out, of course, but that doesn't address the deeper problem. And, and the point here is that uh, what we uh, perceive in our conscious awareness is only a small part of what the brain is doing at any given time. And that deep below the surface of consciousness is a massive amount of processing that new technologies are allowing us to tap into. Uh, this is a graphic of the uh, anatomy of a, a skin eccrine sw uh, sweat gland. Um, every medical student is exposed to this. Uh, and when I was first exposed to this, uh, I had no idea that I was going to spend you know, the next 15 years of my life uh, measuring people's sweat. Um, but what is very interesting is that uh, this is just the end organ, which is our, our dermis. And we have these high concentrations of eccrine sweat glands in our palms and our soles and our underarms. Um, but that the networks of neurons that connect to that little glomerulus there um, originate in, uh, in our brains and in the uh, subcortex of our brain, which I'll show you in a moment. Uh, but first, um, if you've never seen the output of a, a, a skin conducted graph, uh, it looks something like this. This is about 30 seconds. Uh, and essentially, you have this tonic level. Uh, we're all alive, I hope, and, and our bodies are generating an energy. Uh, and that gives us a kind of level of uh, a state of awareness and arousal. And then when we have a large stimulus, we have a large amplitude response. And when we have a smaller stimulus, we have a small amplitude response. And look what happens to our tonic level. It kind of elevates a little bit. And I use the example at night. You're tired. You're getting ready to go to sleep. And you get a phone call from a loved one or a friend you haven't heard from a while. You're like, oh, hey, how are you? Oh, good. Back and forth, back and forth. You hang up the phone, and you're kind of awake. And you're more awake than you were in the beginning. Why is that? Well, you've just had a series of highly relevant emotional connections over a period of time that stimulated the emotion centers of the brain and literally woke you up. Now over time you'll settle back down and go to sleep, but this is uh, something that we can now measure with uh, exquisite sensitivity. And what we're tapping into uh, with, with using these peripheral measures of neurophysiology are these deep structures in the brain. Uh, so often referred to as uh, the limbic system. Uh, think of the brain as having evolved over time and having three layers. I sometimes use a hand puppet. Uh, so so um, this is the cortex. It's wrapping around my thumb, which represents the emotion centers. The palm is our brain stem, and my wrist is the spinal cord. And information comes in and out of the spinal cord. It then quickly goes through the brain stem, or sometimes referred to as that reptilian brain. Right, which really just modulates, uh, are we awake, are we asleep, uh, are we hunger, 
Um, and then the next step it goes to are the emotion centers represented by my thumb. And that's where information is tagged for relevance. And then the third step is my fingers, which is this neocortex. Now what's interesting about this hand puppet model, this is evolution. So we evolved from a prim primitive spinal cord through a reptilian brain to a mammalian brain to this highly complex neocortex that is uniquely human. And look what happens, it wraps around and what does this tip of my finger, which is the prefrontal cortex, the most highly evolved part of the brain, where does it sit? Next to my emotion centers. One third of the brain's energy is dedicated to the connections between the tip of my finger and my thumb. We are wired to regulate our emotions. Uh, and what that allows us to do is to do a lot of impulse control, uh, but ultimately does not eliminate the emotional responses we have. Uh, this is a very exciting uh, image here. This comes from this, let's see if it works. Nope, it's not gonna work. I'm gonna do the static version. Uh, this actually comes from uh, the, the most uh, powerful magnet on the planet. It happens to be in Charlestown uh, across the river, and it is at uh, Mass General. This is the image of a single brain, and this magnet is so powerful you can see every single uh, neuronal connection. And the reason I put that up, the front is, this is the same as my hand puppet here. The front is in the, to your left, the back is to my right, uh, is take a look at this bundle here. This is where the emotion centers are. This is where all the action is. And this is where we have evolved from uh, and something that powerfully drives our behavior. Now, um, early on, uh, I, I won't, I'll spare you the details of this, uh, but I, I ended up being a, um, a reluctant laughter researcher. Uh, and what was interesting about laughter was I came across a, a great book, which uh, I recommend. It's called Laughter, a, a, a Scientific Investigation by a guy named Robert Provine, is that he was the first to take laughter seriously. Uh, and he realized that there was this uh, ubiquitous phenomenon that, that everybody does and that has a, a, an amazing effect on people. And there was a lot of speculation, but not a lot of science. So he came up with this uh, definition, which I love, any highly stereotyped utterance characterized by multiple force, acoustically symmetric, similar vowel-like notes, separated by a breathy expiration and a decrescendo pattern. Ha, ha, ha. <clears throat> Turns out what's nice about laughter is it's very easy to code for. So I had been uh, interested uh, for a while in, uh, in relationships. And what was amazing as a, a young uh, psychiatry resident was the introduction I got to psychotherapy. And, and here was this treatment with no laying on of hands, no surgical intervention, no medication that had outcomes just as powerful. So what was it about just sitting in a room with another person that made people with mild to moderate depression or anxiety or trauma get significantly better? And, and I thought it would be really interesting to, to try to study that. And I knew I couldn't put patients and doctors in fMRI scanners or PET scanners. That wasn't going to fly. So, so I started uh, measuring these neurophysiologic responses and chasing doctors around with, with video equipment and wires. And, and my big idea was we can't just measure the patient. Everybody focuses on the patient. This is a relationship. We've got to model what's happening with, with the, the doctor on the other side. Um, so I had this data and I needed to publish or perish, right, in the academic environment. Uh, so I realized um, no one's ever studied laughter in, in psychotherapy. So I took Bob Provine's work and I built on it and I got some undergraduates to code 10 hours of psychotherapy. Um, and what we found was that just like college students, which is what uh, Dr. Provine had been studying, uh, the ratio of laughter in speakers and audience uh, was actually uh, very tightly coupled. In other words, most laughter comes from speakers and most laughter is punctuating speech. And the audience actually responds slightly lower percentage. But what was interesting in psychotherapy was that the ratio to speaker to audience when you look at therapist and patient was highly different than normal uh, social interaction. What this means is that therapists were actually uh, suppressing their own laughter. They were sort of holding back in that sort of therapeutic mode. Um, the point here, though, however, was I was not just interested in the phenomenon of laughter during psychotherapy from a behavioral perspective. I was interested in it in a physiologic way. And what we found and what, what, uh, what we published back in 2004 was that when patients or therapists laughed alone, not surprisingly, they had an emotional response, and that was measurable. What was interesting was that if they both uh, laughed together, that emotional response was amplified. And it was amplified in a statistically significant way. I was like, okay, well, that's kind of interesting. Maybe this is the beginning of, of, of how we form connections, right? Everybody feels good after they laugh. Everybody feels even better when we laugh together. 
Um, what did this have to do potentially with empathy? So this is a, 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 a three minute segment from a patient-doctor interaction. The patient uh, is actually in pink on the top, the doctor or therapist on the bottom. And uh, what I did and our team did is we basically created a window that looked for moments of physiologic concordance, that laughter moment. Although this wasn't laughter, this were just patients going back and forth during psychotherapy. And we coded those, and then we also looked at moments when there was a discordance. So here you see a moment in contrast to the last one where uh, the patient has a very high arousing moment and the, and the doctor is very flat. And that uh, we, we might call a sort of uh, a, a therapeutic um, uh, disruption or rupture uh, that, that over time can actually lead to, to problems. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to show this video. Uh, it's just a, a few minutes of that patient-doctor interaction. And it's, and it's a little difficult to watch because he's not being very empathic. He's talking over her a lot. She even sits on her hands at one point. And, and uh, um, the physiology shows uh, this very high discordance. And what the bottom graph is showing is just a running correlation of their uh, skin conductance or emotion or arousal curves. And what you see are these um, very large uh, discordant moments where they are just highly uncoordinated, uh, highly um, un uncorrelated in terms of their physiologic response. Um, we ended up uh, doing this across uh, 20 patient therapist dyads uh, and found a, a significant correlation with the patient's perception of therapist empathy. Um, and I, I will also tell you this work has continued and one of my colleagues has built uh, an empathy course for physicians, uh, which turns out uh, medical students start medical school with very high empathy ratings uh, and it gets beaten out of them over the course of the uh, medical training. And so she's working very hard to kind of restore that a little bit. Okay, so, so that's all very interesting. Um, but, but what do we now understand about the brain? And, and what, what I think is really fascinating is that, and I, I'll, I'll spare you the details in the interest of time, is that the, the brain networks that we're now understanding that modulate laughter, that modulate our emotions, and that modulate empathy and connecting with each other are highly interconnected. And, and our ability to understand one another is largely predicated in what's sometimes referred to as the mirror neuron system. And the mirror neuron system in the brain is, is somewhat distributed, but it's what allows us to see another object outside the world, understand it, and then play it back and get meaning out of it. Um, this study is just showing the brain response to people in two conditions. One is looking at the expression of a person and then imitating it and internally trying to generate it. The other condition is merely observing. And the gray areas are, are during the active response. And what you see is that merely observing triggers the same pattern, but in an attenuated way, right? And similarly, when, when, when we have pain, our pain network fires. And when we watch someone who's in pain, our pain network fires, not as strongly. And it turns out there's a difference between if we see someone we love or care about in pain, it's going to fire a lot stronger than if it's a stranger. It's almost a step function in terms of how we relate to each other. So the more familiar we are with someone, the more we trust someone, the more empathy we're going to have with them. And there are correlations uh, with areas in the brain and their activity and people's empathic ability. So some people are just more empathic than others. And this, again, maps on to a little bit of what we were doing. So OK, so now we've got this, this uh, physiologic, neurophysiologic evidence. We've got a, a neurobiology that supports uh, a network of neurons that that sees the world and modulates with each other and shows how patients and doctors and, and really any human dyadic interaction evolves and, and grows and gets stronger. What about connecting with brands and with media? Well, it turns on the mirror neuron system uh, is very sophisticated, but it's not very bright. So it mirrors everything. And, and so when we're watching uh, uh, videos and, and communications and media, um, this network is, is sort of always on. Um, and so what, what we did at Interscope is say, well, perhaps people are connecting with media and marketing messages in the same way they connect with each other. And, and could we look, instead of at two people interacting, could we look at an entire audience engaging with uh, media content? And we, we call this engagement, which is attention to something that emotionally impacts you. And again, lots of mathematics goes into uh, the measurement, which no longer sits in a box, but now we have a biometric belt which measures not only skin conductivity, but heart rate, respiration, and motion. And we often combine that with eye tracking to really give us this powerful lens into the non-conscious. So imagine the prototypical uh, US male who likes media. 
uh, and he likes to watch TV, and he likes bigger and bigger screens. Uh, and the more in depth that is, the more engaged he is, the more the emotion centers of the brain are firing. And we call this immersive engagement. But that same prototypical male wants control, and he wants choice. So whether it's an iPad or a touch screen or a mobile phone, this we call flexible environment, now, uh, flexible engagement. And here, the emotion centers are still important, but now the goal-directed centers and the top-down processing is actually kicking in. And we put these uh, uh, on a simple uh, Cartesian graph, you begin to get a little bit of a model of how people connect with different types of screens and different types of communications uh, in different ways. And this, uh, uh, we think, and we have some evidence to support, is really a continuum. Um, so that the more immersive things are, the more we get taken away. Now, the other thing I like to say about immersive engagement is someone else is the producer and the director. You're going on someone else's journey. And in a flexible environment, typically online or other places, you're the producer and the director of that experience. And that's uh, a fundamentally different sort of brain state. Now, the goal is to increase the emotional and the emotionality to all of these experiences, because that's what's going to break through the clutter, and that's what's going to engage your audience. So um, I'm going to uh, very quickly walk you through a study. Uh, there was a question earlier about generational changes, which um, I think this will get to, which is uh, with Time Warner, we looked at um, two groups, uh, so-called digital natives. Uh, these were uh, predominantly millennials who grew up in the uh, world only knowing a connected world, and digital immigrants. Uh, who are essentially Gen X uh, and Gen, or sorry, Gen X and um, baby boomers. And what we found was there were uh, some fundamental differences. And, and what, what we did methodologically is we put the biometric belts on people in their non-working environment. So in their home in the morning, at night, and then part of the weekend. Um, and then we had point of view cameras so we could see what they were seeing. And we behaviorally coded every second of their experience uh, and then we also looked at the emotional responses as they were consuming different media platforms. And what we found and organized the results across uh, the time spent, the attention, and emotion. And what we found was that they actually, uh, these were heavy consumers of media, they actually spent uh, on average 10 hours with media, and it was about the same for both groups. The major difference was uh, digital versus non-digital. All digital and connected to the web, so smartphones, tablets, uh, computers versus non-digital, which was uh, print television, radio, uh, and newspapers. The thing that got the headline was uh, how much switching was going on. And so when you actually look at when there's more than one platform in their field of vision, and you just literally count how many times they switch uh, per hour, we found that immigrants were, were switching 17 times, which is actually a pretty high number. Uh, natives were switching 27 times, 35% increase. And then when you look at the emotional consequence of that, uh, I think the best way to illustrate that is to show you uh, two, uh, two uh, participants. Um, so this is Isaac, a digital immigrant. Uh, you see this is an evening for him, sort of 8 o'clock to about 11.30. Uh, you can see color-coded are the media platforms. Uh, when it's television alone, it's blue. When it's TV and newspaper, it's brown. Uh, and you can see the striations, which is him switching back and forth between these platforms. Uh, but you can also see uh, that his emotional level goes much higher when he's immersed in television, which is that more immersive and more engaging platform. Look at Nate the Native. You can see right away that his, his choice of two platforms is TV and smartphone. Um, and there's a lot more striations, a lot more back and forth. And his overall level is higher. But his peaks aren't quite as high. And this was a fairly consistent finding. And what we found was that, uh, and what we think is going on, is that when you're on a single platform, you go on this journey, uh, you're having this more immersive engagement. The highs are higher, the lows are high, uh, lower. But when we're sort of switching back and forth between platforms, we don't tolerate the lows, but we don't experience the highs. And so you have this sort of compression of emotional response, and that this is somewhat differential uh, between natives and immigrants. The big difference is that natives are spending more time doing this. So they're going to be in that state more frequently. They also self-reported, uh, we did a survey along with this, uh, that showed that they were more easily bored, more easily distracted, and get, more, uh, get nervous more easily. Uh, these are all statistically significant. Um, this is self-report. They are describing themselves in this way. Uh, and then we borrowed this quote from uh, Sherry Turkle, someday, someday, but certainly not now, I'd like to learn how to have a conversation. 
so there's an obvious implication here. If we're spending more and more time connecting with digital objects and not one-on-one -on -one with each other, um, that raises a question, which is, we know, or from an interscope perspective, we know that human interaction is far more emotionally engaging than even the best television show. The two most engaging moments of every test we do is when our staff walks in in the beginning and gives instructions and walks in at the end and tells people to take things off. There's just something powerful about having a, a live human interact with you uh, that's, that's higher than, than any media. But if we disconnect from that mode of connecting over time, uh, what, what, what I worry a little bit about is that those networks are going to start to get tired. Because like any network, it needs to be reinforced and worked on. Um, and, and what we also think is happening is that the digital natives um, are switching back and forth between immersive and flexible engagement very, very quickly. They're just easy to go back and forth and they, they don't tolerate being bored very well. Um, and and the, a consequence of that is that they don't get the emotional highs. When you do get their attention, and we, we clearly saw this, they will engage just as much as anybody else. So some of the conclusions, uh, people spend a lot of time with media. The natives, uh, uh, almost nothing deserves their full attention, but when you do get them, uh, they will engage. And, and you have to continue to use emotions at the center of what you're doing. And so our recommendation coming out of this was get to the point quickly, instant gratification and emotional intensity from the start. Uh, make it really easy to consume stories, snacking versus three course meals. Uh, uh, speaking of metaphors, um, you know, little, little bits of communications as opposed to these uh, longer ones, um, using multiple platforms. And then I think most importantly is putting emotion at the, at the center of what you do. And that the bar is increasingly raised and higher for brands to break through the clutter and to engage uh, not just uh, uh, the, the generation we know, but the generations coming up, who will be harder and harder to connect with. I will stop there. I'll be around the rest of the day. I appreciate your time and attention. I hope I was able to give you something to think about. Thank you very much. <laughs>